Welcome back to the Casey Adams Show. Today, I am joined by Gary Brecka, the co-founder of 10X Health System and a world-class human biologist. Gary, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, of course. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I've had the privilege of, of actually having some of your partners uh, on the show, Brandon Dawson, Grant Cardone, and it's yeah. just been so remarkable to see what you guys have done together. This is coming from a consumer from the outside, seeing what you guys have built at 10X Health System, and it's been been so cool to see. But for those that may not know what 10X Health System is, I'd love for you to give us a, a high-level overview before we dive into it. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, just quickly, by way of background, for me, I'm a human biologist. Um, so for uh, the better part of 22 years, I was a mortality expert for the insurance industry, uh, which meant if I got five years of medical records on you and five years of demographic data, uh, I could tell the insurance company how long you had to live to the month. And, you know, in reading medical records and looking at what um, made people live longer, healthier, happier lives and what kept people from living longer, healthier, happier lives, I learned a lot about bio-optimization. And I'm a big data guy and a background in research, a background in human physiology and, and, and neuroscience. And about four years ago, I, I started treating a patient named Grant Cardone. And he actually did my test as a favor to another friend of his, an entrepreneur named Alex Morton. And, and when he got this test done, you know, Grant wasn't, um, you know, if you know Grant Cardone, he wasn't really excited about doing this test. But Alex said, you've got to get this test. Done. I'm going to pay for it. And I got on the phone with Grant. And it was a really interesting conversation because... He, when he got on the phone with me, he said, look, man, I got this test done as a favor to a friend. Um, I don't even know what you do. I don't know who you are. But before you start, I should just tell you that I got doctors hanging on trees and I got personal trainers coming out of my ass, his, his exact words. <laughs> and he said, so look, man, I got about uh, 10 minutes. Why don't you give me your spiel? And, wow. Uh, and, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, well, aren't, aren't you kind of a jerk? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, so we started talking. I said, Grant, why don't you just uh, start by telling me how you feel? And he said, Gary, I feel great. I'm running around the world. I'm building my empire. I feel great. And I said, well, do you mind if I tell you what I see in this test? And he said, no, go ahead. And I said, well, I see a man that, that goes to bed tired, but his mind keeps him up until the wee hours of the morning. So that by the time you wake up in the morning, you're more exhausted than when you went to bed. And I said, Grant, I can see that you wake up sore and achy in the morning like you had a workout the night before when you haven't. And I bet it really bothers you that the soles of your feet and your ankles are tender and sore when you get out of bed in the morning. And I said, if I was to guess, I bet, I bet the thing that bothers you most is brain fog. And he said, what the hell do you mean, dementia? And I said, no, brain fog. You get a great idea in the bedroom. By the time you walk to the kitchen, you wonder what the heck you're doing in the kitchen. And I said, look, I know nothing about your love life. Uh, but libido left the building uh, about nine months ago. And he, and then he got a little mad. You know, he said, who told you uh, to say that to me? You know, did Ryan give you that information? Did Cherry give you that information? And I said, no, I'm just, just looking at the test. And he said, you can really tell all of that from a simple gene test? And I said, I sure can. And he said, well, can you fix it? And I said, we, we can It'll take, take a couple of weeks. And he said, listen, man, here's my credit card. I'll do whatever you say, lotions, potions, creams, jellies, or injections. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I rehearsed exactly that because that's exactly what he said. Lotions, <laughs> potions, creams, jellies, or injections. Oh, and my gosh. And I'm like, do we need lotions, potions? <laughs> injections about the only thing that fit. Um, but four weeks later, he called me. He was out of his mind. He told me that his energy level was through the roof. He was sleeping like a stone. He hadn't slept in 10 years. He was chasing his wife around like a high schooler and that all the aches and pains were out of his body. And the phenomenal thing was we didn't put anything into Grant's bloodstream that wasn't already there. We just changed kind of the form and the amount. And, and he came to me and said, listen, man, we've got to bring this to the masses. Um, this works. I, I'm very anti big pharma. I'm anti chemicals, synthetics, pharmaceuticals. I love the way I feel. I love what you're doing for humanity. I want to put you on a platform so you can really make an impact. And so he acquired us in September of 2021. Wow. Um, yep. Put a major cash infusion into the company. And now we're on our way to opening a thousand physical locations in the United States, in 20 in every state in America. Um, you know, we built a, you know, a big uh, training facility to train clinicians on how to read, you know, blood work and genetic testing to turn people into superhumans. And he's provided a platform that's just really exploded and accelerated every 
facet of what we're doing. So, you know, we start with a blood work and a genetic test. Um, we look at 65 biomark 64 biomarkers in the blood, five actionable genes in the human body. And we try to find out what that person is deficient in and then just go about replacing that raw material. Because mm. the truth is that the majority of things that we deal with as a consequence of aging or as a consequence of being an entrepreneur or a stressful life or an active yeah. schedule are not consequences of any of those things. They're consequences of not having the right raw material in the human body. Um, yeah. It's amazing what happens to human beings when you just give their body the raw material uh, to do its job. Absolutely. And I appreciate you for sharing that story. And, you know, one thing that you spoke about just regarding um, your past prior to 10X Health System is this idea of, you know, a mortality expert. And, you know, there was a video that I saw that I know went, you know, viral in a sense of with you and Dana White talking about, you know, predicting his death down to the month. And, you know, I right. think this is a conversation where I would love to ask you when you, when you first were able to, you know, find out how to do that and the response from that video, like how is that possible for those that are genuinely wondering? And I know that in, in Dana's voice and the conviction he has, you could just see how much he's changed as a man and from a, from a health perspective. But for those that are, that haven't seen that video, I'll make sure to link it down below. But for those that have like myself, how is that possible? How, he, how can you predict or potentially, potentially predict someone's death down to the month? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you asked because, because everybody, um, attacks me for that background, but nobody ever actually calls me out and says, how does it happen? And so I'm really glad <laughs> you're asking because, um, I wish the people that said that that's totally, you know, fraudulent fake science would actually ask me what's the real science behind it. It's actually one of the most honed areas of science in the world. And, you know, in fact, the database that I had access to was one of the largest population databases in the world. There were 370 million lives in that database. Wow. And I'll start by saying um, we do not do a test, a blood test and a gene test that can predict your death. In order to actually do a mortality model, you need five to 10 years of medical records and five to 10 years of demographic data. So the gene mm -hmm. test that I encourage everybody to take and the blood test that I encourage everybody to take is not what determines how many more months you have left on Earth. But if you get 10 years of medical records, five to 10 years of medical records and five to 10 years of demographic data, you can hone in on someone's um, probability of mortality to the month. And the way it works, first of all, if you think about it and take a step back, insurance companies, especially life insurance companies, have data that no other medical enterprise has, no other um, functional medicine doctor, no, no clinical trial ever conducted, not the FDA, not the CDC, no entity or, or, or um, medical body has. And that is that they know the day, the date, the time, the location, and the cause of death, every single person that they've insured since the beginning of time. Wow. And this information is pooled and shared. I mean, think about it for a second. A life insurance company, when they're going to um, take a risk on your life, they're going to bind $25 million worth of risk on your life or $50 million worth of risk on your life, which, by the way, happens all the time. When they take that kind of risk, they're betting on one variable. One, how many more months does this person have left on earth? And it is some of the most accurate science. In fact, it's accurate enough that they're willing to take 25 million of risk on that single variable. That's how accurate it is. And if you wanna know um, how good insurance companies are at doing it, just take a look at the last financial services crisis. We had 364 yeah. banks fail. You didn't have a single life insurance company fail. Not one. In fact, when AIG, one of the biggest financial enterprises in the planet was about to fail, the only thing that saved them was the life insurance division. So it is very accurate science. And essentially what it is, it's a combination of looking at blood biomarkers and predicting if your blood has this setup, if your liver has this function, if you have this level of hypercholesterolemia, if you have this level of hypertriglyceridemia, blood fat, if you're this good or this poor at regulating blood sugar, if you're poor or good at, at uh, um, managing oxygen in your blood, your red blood cell counts, your hemoglobin levels, and then looking at your family history and starting to stack up things called morbidities and comorbidities. So for example, if you're um, diabetic, you have a debit. If you're morbidly obese, you get a debit. If you have hypertension, you have a debit. But if you're an obese, diabetic, hypertensive, that's not one plus one plus one equals three. That's one plus one plus one equals 10. And they know exactly how this shortens your lifespan because they have 
hundreds of millions of lives that they've tracked and said, if these conditions do not change, clinical deficiency in vitamin D3, declining liver function, low filtration rate in the kidney, poor oxygen transfer, high levels of insulin, what we call hyperinsulinemia, then we can not only predict the progression of the onset of, but the progression of disease. And if that database that I had access to could see the light of day, I promise you it would permanently change the face of humanity because we saw all kinds of medical error and medical misdiagnosis that would go on that went unchecked that was causing early onset of pathology and disease and early death. And I'll give you a perfect example. People that are clinically deficient in the, in the nutrient vitamin D3, the sunshine vitamin, the only yeah. vitamin that human beings make on our own, arguably the most important compound in the human body. When you wow. become clinically deficient in just that one nutrient, you eventually develop rheumatoid arthritis-like symptoms. You don't have rheumatoid arthritis, but you develop those symptoms. If you go to the wrong physician, um, and you start to describe your symptomology, you will get diagnosed with rheumatoid if they don't pull up RA factors and don't look at blood work. Wow. And now what they do for rheumatoid, they put you on something called a corticosteroid. Well, we knew in the mortality space, the medical community was not aware of this, but we knew in the mortality space that if you started taking a corticosteroid, you had exactly six years in one day until hmm. you were having a joint replacement. And wow. then once you have a joint replacement, your mobility goes down, meaning we reduce what's called your ambulatory profile, the profile of how well you move. And as you may or may not know, sitting is the new smoking, right? Sedentary lifestyle is the leading cause of all cause mortality, wow. right? We have become very sedentary as a society. I know that's probably most of the entrepreneurs that are listening to this don't fall into that category. Um, but, but as a society, especially Americans, we just do not move enough anymore. Yeah. So now I start to reduce your ambulatory profile and I can bring in all of the diseases that exacerbate with reduced mobility. And we can not only predict the onset of, but the severity of, and how quickly you will succumb to those diseases. Now, can we predict if you're going to be the, um, you know, the victim of an act of violence? No. Can we predict if you're yeah. going to die in a commercial airline crash? No. Can we predict if you get hit by a bus? Absolutely not. Those are mitigating risk factors that marginally move your life expectancy. And we, calculate for those factors. But as a population, it is extraordinarily accurate science. The science is accurate enough that Lincoln National Life or John Hancock or AIG will put $50 million worth of risk on your life. No other financial services enterprise takes that kind of risk. There's not a hedge fund in America that will put money into a startup company based on one variable. You know, based on whether or not they continue to have one client or based on whether yeah. or not they continue to be led by the same CEO or based on whether or not they continue to be the leader in a single product. They just don't take that kind of single variable risk because they haven't honed in on the data that allows them to take that kind of risk. Life insurance companies, annuities and reverse mortgages have. Um, insurance companies, if you've ever heard of an annuity, uh, especially something called a SPIA, a single premium immediate yeah. annuity. This is where you at any age, at your age, Casey, you could stroke a check to an insurance company and they will guarantee you an income stream for life. Now, what do you think they're basing that income stream on? Just random nonsense or just some actuarial table that they pulled off of Google? No, they're basing that income stream off of your specific mortality. And by the way, I wasn't the only one that did this. If you Google life expectancy companies, you will see hordes of companies and their level of accuracy, 88%, 92.5%, 94%, meaning on the pool of mortality that they've done predictions on how accurate are they at predicting life expectancy. And it's very um, refined science when you say you have a 24-year-old male or female, a 35-year-old male or female. 50 year old male or female and they have these conditions going on in their body that may or may not be symptomatic hypoxia for example hides in plain sight all kinds of things hide in plain sight but we're going to predict when this is going to become severe and how quickly they will succumb to it and if i was to to sort of summarize my entire career in one sentence it would be that the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease the presence of oxygen wow. is the absence of disease. There is not. And what do you mean by that? What I mean is there's not a single disease etiological pathway known to mankind that does not have its roots in a lack of blood oxygen. 
all cancer begins in a hypoxic environment. Diabetes and Alzheimer's begin in hypoxic environments. We know Alzheimer's, for example, now is not even Alzheimer's disease. It's type 3 diabetes. It's insulin resistance in the brain. So if we saw that you were at a certain age and you had insulin resistance and it was unchecked and it wasn't being managed, we would assume that that insulin resistance would continue. We could yep. predict the onset of um, a decline in mental function. As mental function declines, you're less compliant. As compliance declines, mortality accelerates. I mean, the third leading cause wow. of death in America, you're welcome to Google it. There's a Harvard study and a, and a Johns Hopkins study from 2016 and 18 um, said that m medical error was the third leading cause of death in America. Medical error. That's crazy. And it, it's astounding when you think that modern medicine is the third leading cause of death until you start to process yeah. that it's the third leading cause of death in the industry designed to prevent death. I mean, if you translate yeah, that, that's no, crazy. Any other industry, it would be laughable, right? Yep. I mean, if, if you were a blue check verification company and you were the <laughs> leading cause of people having their Instagram account, banned, you're probably out of business. You know, if you sold home security systems and you were the third leading cause of home invasion, you wouldn't have an enterprise. It would be laughable. But modern medicine is the third leading cause of death and modern uh, medical error. And yet that's where we go for answers to optimal health. And the second thing that we discovered in, in this level of mortality research was that the majority of things that affect mankind and humanity that we would call consequences of aging, or consequences of stress, or just consequences of our environment, are not consequences of any of those things. They are missing raw material in the human body. They are simple deficiencies in the human body that are keeping you from reaching a state of optimization. And I always say that, you know, the majority of People that, you know, see me speak or listen to, to podcasts like this, they are probably right now walking around at about 55 or 60 percent of their true state of normal. Because if they do not know what raw materials, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, nutrients, their body is missing. If they don't know what raw materials their body can methylate, meaning refine into the usable form and what they can't then they are purely supplementing for the sake of supplementing. They're just guessing and they're hoping that somehow they hit the mark. But if you ask your body a very specific set of questions, you look at five actionable genes, you look at 64 biomarkers in the blood, it will give you a very specific roadmap for what it needs to perform optimally. And I'm not talking about chemicals or synthetics or pharmaceuticals. I'm talking about basic nutrients that are missing from the body that are keeping it from reaching an elevated state of performance. I mean, if you look at Grant Cardone, he does not look, act, or perform like a 64-year-old. Not at all. Right? I mean, yeah. he runs circles around. I mean, I'm 52. <laughs> he runs circles yeah. around me, but I outrun, you know, most, most guys half my age too. Yeah, no, I mean, just, just hearing you speak about all this, Gary, I, I get so many different questions that, that come up, and it, it's so powerful to hear you speak on this. I, I want to talk about biohacking and some of some of the key things that that have helped improve your life, right? Like, for example, and, and I want to give context and even speak about it here. Like, I'm 22. I just ran my first marathon recently. I've, I've been very into the whole cold immersion. I've had a cold plunge here in my spot for the last four months. And I personally have noticed a, a significant difference of, of how I feel after working out, soreness. Like it really helped improve my performance in my marathon in my, in my perspective. I would love to just talk. What are some of the things that have genuinely helped improve your life from a biohacking standpoint that the listeners could today could walk away with? to you know, move them in the right direction of feeling better and being more optimized? Yeah, well, you know, I'm in my biohacking room right now. I mean, one of my red light, the red light therapy bed is right behind me. Uh, uh, Hypermax oxygen uh, um, right here. I do exercise with oxygen therapy 10 minutes, 10 minutes a day. And then I use a PMF mat pulse electromagnetic field. So uh, that equipment will run you about 150 grand. So let's talk ooh. about what you can do for free, right? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> right, yeah. right. 150 grand? Send me a DM, I'll send you the equipment. But the truth is that I don't expect, nor does Grant expect anyone to spend that kind of money to put this equipment in their house. What I've, I've done it for convenience. But the truth is that what we need as human beings is to get back in touch with the basics, right? We get three things from mother nature. We get magnetism from the earth. We get oxygen from the air. We get light from the sun. The less of those three things that we get and the further away from those three things we get, the further we get from a state of optimal health. So let's, so let's talk about magnetism, right? We get magnetism from the earth. Think about the last time that you had bare feet touching bare soil, grass, dirt, sand, actually contacting the surface of the earth. 
When we don't contact the surface of the earth, we don't ground. We, it's called earthing, or grounding. This is a very real concept, by the way. Um, human beings, when we come in contact with the surface of the earth, we actually discharge into the earth. Human beings build up a charge in our body. It makes us acidic and less alkaline. We know, most of us know that a state of slight alkalinity is a much healthier state. You know, you probably heard that cancer cannot survive in an alkaline environment. Most diseases cannot survive or thrive in an alkaline environment. So how do we become more alkaline? Well, one of the best ways is to earth or ground, contact the surface of the earth. It's a complete fallacy that you can get alkaline by drinking alkaline water. That is the biggest marketing myth ever sold to the public, wow. right? Because in chemistry, in molecular biology, something cannot donate its properties and also maintain them. In other words, if an alkaline glass of water donated the properties, specifically the hydrogen and, and the electrical charge that makes it alkaline, if it donated those properties, it would have lost them. So now it becomes alcohol, it becomes acidic when it donates alkaline properties. So drinking alkaline water is not bad for you. It, it actually doesn't make you more acidic, but it will not make the body alkaline. You want to become alkaline, mm. contact the surface of the earth, walk on the surface of the earth, touch the surface of the earth. Earthing and grounding are very, very real things. One of the reasons why you feel so good when you go to the beach is because yeah. you spend a lot of time contacting the earth. Um, so you don't need a $5,000 PEMF mat. You just need Mother Earth and it's free. Get outside. You know, a lot of people talk about morning walk. If you can do a morning walk without shoes on, if you're in an area that's not cold enough to be able to do that, then you'll not only blow EMF frequency, microwave, radio wave, 5G, what we call um, electromagnetic fields, dirty fields out of the body. You will also shift the alkalinity of the body. Remember, pH is a charge. It stands for potential hydrogen. If I want to change the charge, I run magnetic current through the body. Now, you can also do this with a PEMF mat. You don't have to buy mine. You don't have to buy the 10X one. There's lots of great manufacturers out there. And if you lay on a PEMF mat for 12 to 16 minutes a day, you'll wake up alkaline every day of your life. Wow. So what does alkalinity do for you? Well, if you, um, I just did a podcast with Ben Greenfield, for example. He came I love her. Oh, I love this. I, yeah, I've had Ben on here before and he is just incredible. But oh, he's up. amazing. I mean, five minutes after he was in my house, he's thrown a suppository in oh my the back gosh. Of the kitchen, and then he did a full inversion on my refrigerator, which my fiance had to get a little used to. But uh, <laughs> he goes, what wow. do you do in our kitchen? And now he's upside down on my refrigerator. <laughs> this is one of your idols? I go, freaking love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> that is but so great. I love Ben. But what we did was we said, um, you know, if, if alkalinity is having an impact on us, how could we measure it? So we did something called dark field, where we actually pricked our, our blood put it onto a slide. We looked at our um, red blood cells. I have the video on my Instagram. Um, we looked at our red blood cells under a microscope before we got on a PEMF mat. And if you do this, you'll see that all your red blood cells are kind of clumped together and stuck together. Because when, when cells have the same charge, they can't touch. As soon as they get opposite charges, they're attracted. Every disease state known to mankind is a state of low voltage. All cancer cells are low voltage cells. So we want to raise the voltage in the body. So then we laid on a PMF mat. And after we got off the PMF mat, we clicked our finger again. You can see that the cells were repolarized. And now they were all separated and all kind of free flowing beautifully. All that increased surface area to bring in oxygen. Um, so that is a healthy state. So earthing, grounding, or using a PMF mat. So I'm taking you from free to yep. what you can spend money on. And then the next thing is oxygen. You know, we get oxygen from the, from the air. But the truth is most of us are actually not breathing much anymore. If you look at um, what happens in, in elderly patients as we age, our respiratory rate slowly declines. Our posture changes, we fold in on our lungs, our lung volumes decrease. So we're actually just not breathing. Everything that you perceive about energy, Casey, is nothing more than oxygen in your blood. Oxygen is so important. If you look at your mood or your emotional state, like if you were to ask me, Gary, what is a mood? What is an emotional state? Well, it's a collection of neurotransmitters bound to oxygen. If you look at every elevated emotional state that a human being can experience, passion, elation, joy, arousal, libido, all, you know, what I call, hell yeah, I want the lottery emotions, yeah. right? Yeah, the really great emotions. Every single one of those emotional states 
has oxygen as a part of its molecular structure. When you look at suppressed emotional states, anger, despair, jealousy, resentment, vengeance, these emotional states require no oxygen. You can actually feel every one of those emotional conditions with very little oxygen, if any, in your bloodstream. Mm. And if you want to do an experiment, right, um, um, just um, when your spouse is in a delta wave of sleep tonight, understand that no human being has ever woken up laughing. You can't wake up from deep sleep laughing. Why is that? Because you don't have the oxidative state to experience laughter. Mm. But can you wake up angry? Yeah. Yes. Pinch your spouse tonight while they are dead asleep. And watch them wake up pissed off. Oh my God. Because anger requires no oxygen. Elevated emotional states do. So if we want to elevate our mood, if we want to elevate our emotional state, we need to get oxygen into our blood. One of my favorite ways is through Wim Hof breathing. Um, yep. You know, I give credit where credit is due. He is the pioneer of breath work. I'm actually in the process of being Wim Hof certified. I'm going. Oh, in wow. I think March to the Pyrenees for five days with my son, with Wim Hof. Wow. And, uh, you know, we're doing the five days and the ice challenge, and, um, getting in really cold water and you know, hiking barefoot in the, uh, in oh my gosh. Frozen tundra. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so how do we, how do we raise our oxidative state? You know, Wim Hof teaches a method, three rounds of 30 breaths. I use it every day. Um, I also use a style of, of, um, of breathing, um, that, you know, that, Spartans used before um, before wartime, you know, decades or centuries ago, um, and haka breathing. A lot of uh, um, you know, uh, rugby teams will do these haka dances before they actually have competition, like the um, the All Blacks in New Zealand, arguably yeah. the greatest rugby team of all time. Um, and these have meaning because it's a way of bringing oxygen into the body to elevate the emotional state, improve our mental acuity, our hand eye coordination, speed, timing, strength, and agility. So yeah. three rounds of 30 deep breaths with an exhale breath hold in between, followed by an inhale breath hold, and then another 30 breaths. Doing that for three rounds, if you ever, if you see me on Instagram or you look at any of the things I talk about, in fact, today I actually videotaped my morning breath work session with my daughter. All my kids do it, my fiance does it, my whole family does it. I will miss a flight to not miss breath work. Wow. I haven't missed a day in probably 32, 34 months, not a single day. Wow. Um, that is incredible. I, I, have a, I want to stop you right there. Just, I'm curious. Like I, I saw your Instagram and I, I know that you, you instill all these incredible things into your, your children. What is the difference of impact? You know, if a, a 10 year old, a, a 12 year old starts doing something like this early on versus, you know, maybe there's someone who's 65 listening today and they're just coming across this. Like what is the true impact? And, you know, if what's the difference of, of impact versus uh, someone that's 12 or 65? Oh my gosh. I mean, so as I said, the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease, long-term hypoxia, low states of oxygen, not only suppress mood and not only suppress our emotional state, but they disrupt the function of every organ system in the body. And so waste elimination, repair, detoxification, regeneration are all oxygen intensive processes in the body. Think about this for a moment. Human beings are not powered by the food we eat, by the air that we breathe, by the, by the um, nutrients that we put into the body. We're powered. All of those things become a very specific type of energy source called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. All of those things are necessary, but that is not what powers a human being. The battery that powers a human being is called the mitochondria, and the mitochondria is what creates something called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is the fuel that allows human beings to have energy, to eliminate waste, to repair, to detoxify, to regenerate, um, to have cellular replication. So ATP is the absolute essence of life. 10% of your body weight is mitochondria, the powerhouse mm -hmm. of the cell. You have 110 yep. trillion mitochondria in your body. So now if I was to slice a mitochondria open, you'd see that inside the mitochondria, there's a little motor and it's spinning around. Right. This motor is called the Krebs cycle. Every time this Krebs cycle makes one revolution, it has two choices. It e is either going to create 34 units of energy or it's going to create two units of energy. Mm -hmm. So let me say that again. The motor makes one revolution and it either creates 16 times more energy or it creates 16 times less energy. 
What is the difference between that mitochondria creating 16 times more energy and six or 16 times less energy? The presence of oxygen. Wow. We call it aerobic or anaerobic respiration. All of us are familiar with this from our muscles burning, from the exercise intensely, but we may not be familiar with the fact that these mitochondria that have these motors inside of them, if we're able to drive oxygen into the mitochondria, we will have a 16 fold step up in energy times 110 trillion mitochondria in 32 trillion cells. So you start to get an idea of the impact of that oxygen has on physiologic function. Imagine if I could have a 16 fold step up in cellular energy. It's like walking onto a car lot and, <laughs> and they only sell two cars. One's a hundred horsepower, one's 1600 horsepower. Yeah. The only difference is what fuel you put into that vehicle. Well, I'd rather have the 1600 horsepower. Yep. And so um, learning how to breathe, breath work, um, is, in my opinion, one of the most important things you can do. I mean, one of the reasons why I accelerate that with this hyper max oxygen yeah. system is I take 95% O2 and I breathe it under mild exercise on the treadmill. Um, and I use an AMF free treadmill that's not plugged into the wall, it's not powered. And um, you walk on that for 10 minutes a day and it's called exercise with oxygen therapy. The only two time Nobel laureate prize winner in, in um, medicine won the Nobel prize both times for his work in exercise with oxygen therapy. Wow. And so magnetism from the earth, or PMF net, oxygen from the air, breath work, or hypermax system, and then light from the sun. Um, and I use a red light therapy bed that actually pulls all the UVA and UVB rays um, out, and it leaves the infrared and the near infrared rays that will drive oxygen into the mitochondria, force gases out of the mitochondria called mitochondrial nit nitric oxide, repair collagen, elastin, and fibrin in the skin, um, you know, I'm 52 years old. I mean, I get a lot of comments on men. Your skin looks great for a 52 year old man. I spend a lot of time yep. in a red light. Um, That's awesome. But if you can't, first light is the most nutritional source of light on the planet. You know, during the first 45 minutes of the day, there's no damaging rays from the sun. There's no UVA. There's no UVB. The blue light that comes from the sun, not the damaging blue light, but that comes from your screens. But the blue light that comes from the sun in the first 45 minutes of the day resets the melatonin receptors. It resets cortisol receptors. Some of the healthiest light that you can get, and it is free. So walking yeah. on the surface of the earth, breath work, and getting morning sunlight would be ways on a budget of zero that you can have a demonstrative impact on your health. Ditto that for cold water. Right? Uh, I, I was about to ask you about that. What's, like, what's your experience with cold water? I know you're doing the Wim Hof uh, five day retreat. Like, and I listen to different podcasts on this, and I, and I'm, I know a lot of my listeners do as well. Like, what do you think about cold immersion, cold showers, everything that has to do with that? Um, well, I think that um, you know the science on cold water therapy is astounding. You know, I sit on the board of the NFL Alumni Association. I'm their health services director. We used to think that putting athletes in cold water after intense exercise was beneficial because it was reducing inflammation. Mm -hmm. We know now that that's only fifteen percent of the benefit. Yes, it's beneficial but it's only 15% of the benefit. So what else is happening when you immerse yourself in cold water? Well, first of all, water is 29 times more thermogenic than air. And that means that it removes heat from the body at 29 times the rate of air. This wow. is why you can die in 72 degree water and you can die in 72 degree air. You can get hypothermia in 72 wow. degree water. Um, if you stay there long enough, in fact, there's a movie coming out about three NFL football players that flip their boat in Tampa. Um, held on to the motor after the boat wow. had been capsized. These are professional athletes, um, and two of them drowned in 74 degree Gulf, Gulf water. Oh, no hey. Wow. 29 times more thermogenic than air, 29 times the heat removal. So, what happens when you immerse yourself in cold water? Well, first of all, you get a massive peripheral vasospasm. So, when your peripheral um, vascular system spasms and clamps down, it forces blood into the core. It not only forces blood into the core, but it concentrates oxygen in the core and oxygen to the brain in an effort to save your life. Why is that so important? Because the only other time that that occurs is in deep delta sleep. It only occurs in the deepest part of deep sleep. You have to remember that our brain is a non-metabolic organ. So what does that mean? It means that if I pick up a weight and I start to curl my bicep, right? 
Uh, my body's going to send more blood flow to that muscle, more oxygen to that muscle, more amino acids to that muscle because it's working hard, right? So it will yep. provide it more nutrients. That's not what happens in the brain. You can be sitting in front of your screen watching The Simpsons or sitting in front of your screen solving the most complex partnership agreement, document, joint venture, legal contract you've ever tried to solve, 40 pages long, it's twisting your brain in a knot. Your brain is not getting one ounce more oxygen, one ounce more nutrients, one ounce um, um, uh, more amino acids or fuel, right? So it's a non-metabolic organ. So if we really want to care for the brain, the more we can drive oxygen to the brain in a state of rest, then the healthier it is, which is why when you're in a delta wave of sleep, then you get the same amount of oxygen. It's very restorative to the brain. You can mimic that with cold water immersion. The other mm -hmm. thing that it does um, is it, it causes the release of something called a cold shock protein. And if you ever really want to look up something fascinating, look up the cold shock proteins. These are reserve proteins. They're in the liver. They come out in times of um, exposure to cold water. The liver floods the blood with cold shock proteins. These will scour the blood of free radical oxidation and quadruple the rate of protein synthesis, muscle repair. So you're actually repairing from the cold shock protein more than you are the lack of inflammation. Um, and then the final thing it does is it activates a specific kind of fat in the body called brown fat. Um, white fat is kind of the fat that we don't like to see. It's, or, you know, uh, makes us chubby. Brown fat is our, is our thermogenic energy source. It's the heater. It can actually create heat. And so when you activate your brown fat reserves, you are entering a state of extreme caloric expenditure. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, no amount of hits cardio, no amount of weight training, no amount of intense exercise, nothing that even comes close to cold water immersion for stripping fat off of a person's body. Wow. Remember, a calorie is the definition of heat. It's a measure of heat. The definition of a calorie is the amount of energy that it takes to raise one cubic centimeter of water, one degree centigrade. Mm. So if a calorie is a measure of heat, what do you think is leaving your body when heat is leaving your body? Calories. Yeah. There is nothing that will cause wow. you to expend more calories than getting in cold water. If you know the story about Michael Phelps, you know, when he went to the Beijing um, Olympic Games, his caloric intake went from um, 4,000 calories a day to over 10,000 calories a day. So his training wow. didn't change. Training didn't change one bit. So what happened to cause a, a tripling his caloric intake? The pool he was training in was four degrees colder than the pool he was used to. Wow. He was in there six hours a day, right? So that's the kind of caloric expenditure you have. In fact, that's how I snare most women into getting them into a cold one. Because they're like, nope, no, okay, cold shock protein, just find it. Yeah. Uh, peripheral vagal spasm. I'll just take some deep breath. Yep. Wait a second, fat loss? Did you say fat loss? And then they're jumping into cold water. So. <laughs> no, this is good. This is good. I, I've been trying to get my girlfriend to get in there as well. So this is awesome. Good. Play the video about fat loss. She'll be in the shower before we're finished, you know? Oh, my God. So speaking of, and I know I have a couple more questions here, Gary. I could ask you questions for hours on end here, and I really appreciate your time. But when it comes to cold water immersion, I know there's many different ways to do it. I have a cold plunge here in my, my plays. People do cold showers. If you were to give a, a quick you know, 60 second overview of the best ways to utilize cold therapy, cold immersion. What do you say to people, those that maybe do have a cold plunge like myself, best practices versus someone that may not? So again, let's, let's, let's start on, on let's start at zero, you know, zero cost so that people can get off of this podcast and go put this to, to work in their life without dropping five, six, seven thousand dollars on a cold plunge. Um, so the first thing you can do is you can, you can take a cold shower. So shower off, do your warm shower, soap up, rinse off, um, and then step away from the shower. Turn the water as cold as it can get. Let it run for a minute and get ice cold. Then take four deep breaths like that. Take a very deep breath and step into that water stream, fully into the water stream while you breathe out and just deal with it. Aging is the aggressive pursuit of comfort. The more aggressively we pursue comfort, the faster we age. And wow. so step into that stream of water and just deal with it. And what's going to happen, it's going to be really cold. Your body's going to tell you to get out and you need to push yourself through that and stay in that water initially for 30 seconds, work your way up to a minute and eventually to three minutes. And it will become your drug of choice. Anybody that I know that practices cold water immersion on a regular basis says, 
this is my drug of choice or something to that effect. You know, I mean, right. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's be a bad mood getting out of the cold plunge. Yeah. Right. It's, you're it's impossible. Mood, <laughs> but you're never in a bad mood getting out. And it yep. lasts for seven hours, right? Because you flooded the body with cold shock proteins. You flooded um, oxygen to the brain. And so that's where I would start if you haven't done it and you don't want to make the investment in cold plunge. But cold plunging, and I, I, I'm a huge um, uh, you know, data person. I, I, I've read, I'd like to think every peer-reviewed published clinical study, including what um, Huberman is doing on cold plunging. Um, there is no evidence that colder is better. Um, meaning getting below 50 degrees um, is better or that significantly prolonged periods of time in a, in a cold plunge or any more beneficial than short shocking periods uh, of time, at least not in the clinical evidence right now. So I do cold plunging at 48 to 50 degrees, three minutes minimum, six minutes maximum, and I do it every day. And so 48 to 50 degrees is tolerable. Yes, people can get in there at 37 degrees. Sometimes it's just a rite of passage. I saw the you know images of you cut through the ice and sitting in there. It's, yeah, I think it's, that's it's detrimental. It's just that it's not necessary. Right? For sure. 50 to, 48 to 50 degrees, three minutes minimum, six minutes maximum. Maximum peripheral vasoconstriction, maximum um, cold shock protein, maximum activation of, of, of brown fat. Um, and, and starting the, the shiver, and then you get out and you've, you've gotten the benefit. One of the things I, I don't like seeing on, um, you know, in the social media realm right now that's starting to trend is these guys getting in 37 degree water, going under the water and using a snorkel or a straw, and sometimes staying under for 10, 12 minutes. That's very dangerous. You know, you got to remember that your brain is only this far inside the surface of your skull. It is not good to freeze your brain, it is not good to bake your brain. Staying in a 220 degree sauna for 30 minutes is very dangerous. And then going from a 220 degree sauna to 37 degree water is very dangerous. Take an ice cube and drop it in room temperature water and watch what happens to it. Then heat that water to 220 degrees and drop the same ice cube in there and watch it actually split and shatter. Right? Wow. We don't want to shatter ourselves. We don't want to freeze our brain. We're only, you know, this is not a manly contest. This is a wellness um, device. And so it should be used that way, right? It's, yep. not, it's, it's um, you know, it's like, you know, eventually, you know, heavy weight becomes a risk. Um, alcohol yep. becomes a risk. Everything in excess can become a risk. So for those of you that are new to cold plunging and you get out and you start getting confused about what's out there on the internet, 50 degrees, three minutes minimum, six minutes maximum, you will kill it like that every day. Um, and now most of the evidence will, will, will support that doing it prior to exercise is actually more beneficial than doing it afterwards. Afterwards. Wow. I truly appreciate all of the, the insight there. That was very, very beneficial. And, and I truly, it means the world to hear that. Gary, before we wrap up, I, I wanted to end with, you know, you have been in this field and a researcher, um, a biohacker for decades now. If you were to go back in time and give yourself a piece of advice, life and business or business, what would that advice be and why? Oh my God. I would give myself two pieces of advice. Um, number one, um, pursue a purpose, not, uh, not, not wealth. I spent the first 45 years of my life aggressively trying to be wealthy. Um, and I saw it sort of wealth at all costs. I just wanted to be rich. Um, I wasn't harnessing the power of the universal law of attraction. Um, I was very inauthentic. Um, you know, I was predicting when people were going to die and it wasn't until I shifted my focus to people's well-being, started living not a life of, um, significance, but a life of service. And as I moved into a life of service and I started focusing on people's well-being, I became wealthy beyond my personal imagination. I mean, Grant Cardone's made me very wealthy, but it was a byproduct of focusing on people's um, wellness. There's a very interesting clinical study, um, called the Spain scale of emotion, S-P-A-N-E stands for the scale of positive and negative emotion. And what they were able to do was take people and put them in a Faraday's cage and measure frequency leaving their body. And a lot of people talk about the universal law of attraction. For 22 years, I thought it was a bunch of spiritual mumbo jumbo. And so one day I was reading a physics journal. And yes, I read physics, physics journals. First. <laughs> um, I read any medical love that. journals. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I read two or three of, you know, uh, published clinical research uh, studies tonight. But I was reading, reading a physics journal. I stumbled upon a law in physics called um, constructive interference. And what it says is that if two frequencies of equal wavelength meet, the size of the frequency doubles, which means 
that you can get energy from conversation. You can get energy from other people. Other people can take energy from you because destructive interference says if the wavelengths are in opposite wavelength, that they cancel each other out. By the way, this law is as valid as the law of gravity. And so I started to rethink about that. And I said, well, this sort of means that the universe, there's something to this universal law of attraction because human beings are just a giant ball of frequency. And then I read the Spain scale of emotion and they measured frequency leaving the human body with such accuracy that they were able to isolate the mood that the person was in by the frequency leaving their body. Wow. Meaning they could, a practitioner on a different floor in a separate building could actually tell exactly what emotional state that person was experiencing. Wow. And they isolated the most powerful frequency to leave a human being's body. And the most powerful frequency to leave a human being's body, you want to take a guess? Most people say love. It's four times the amplitude of love. Anger? Um, anger is very low, actually. Oh, um, nice. It's the frequency of authenticity. Mm. And they discern that authenticity only occurs when the person's words were truthful and they believed what they were saying. Wow. In the absence of either one of those, they could not emanate a frequency of authenticity. And if you've ever heard that things like women are more intuitive, it's actually not true. Women are more sensitive to frequency. They can sense more aptly than a man that someone is inauthentic. You know, you ever meet somebody and they're dressed well and they speak well and there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with them. They're probably attractive. And then just something inside you says, there's something wrong with that one. You know, yeah. um, I just, I don't want to do business with them. I don't trust them. There's something off and you can't put a finger on it. It's their lack of authenticity. And until you find a way in life to be authentic, you will never reach a state of happiness or enlightenment or true state of en en enjoyment. You know, you will spend your life chasing the thing that will, the universe will never give to you. Um, you know, I happened to find something that I would do for free and I monetized it. Yeah. You can find something that you would do for free and monetize it. And you, and you are authentic about your mission. Um, in, in doing that, you, you'll, You'll not only be wealthy beyond imagination, but you will be so deeply satisfied at a spiritual level um, that I wasted a lot of my youth and a lot of my young adulthood pursuing something that the universe was never going to let me have. Wow, that is powerful. That was a long answer thank, to a short question. No, that, that was, no, thank, Gary, that, that was beyond powerful. And, you know, I, I very much so appreciate your time. And before we wrap up, I want to give you the honor of saying, where is the best place for everyone listening or watching to learn more about you, follow your journey and learn more about what you guys are doing at 10X Health Systems? Yeah, I mean, follow me on Instagram at Gary Brecca. Um, all I do is teach on Instagram. Um, you know, I talk about breath work, morning routine, diet, lifestyle, spiritual well-being, cold plunging, red light, um, travel tips, all the things that I've learned over 22 years of reading research. I quote the research. I will sometimes put the research links up there for the um, for the bro science community. And, um, um, you know, that likes to doubt what, what I'm saying. <laughs> a lot of haters on Instagram. I love those guys. Uh, you know, and I dispel a lot of myths about diet, you know, keto is dangerous. Well, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. There's essential fats, there's essential proteins, nothing uh, that we call an essential carbohydrate. So I'll, you, what I'll do is I'll put, you know, good sound clinical research on there and guidelines and, and, and put it out there for people so they can live longer, healthier, happier lives. Because I truly feel like the information doesn't belong to me. The information flows through me, but it really belongs to humanity. So if my competitors Love and that. everybody else wants to put it in practice, great. It's going to make the world a better place. <laughs> um, so that's a great spot to, to, to find some of those materials. Perfect. I will make sure to link that down below. And with that being said, Gary, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was absolutely incredible, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Casey. I enjoyed talking to you. We'll do it again sometime. Absolutely. Take care, my friend.